Let us pray to the Lord, Lord of mercy. O O Master Christ, our God, King of the ages and maker of all things, I thank you for all the good things which you have bestowed upon me and for this partaking of your immaculate and life-giving mysteries. Wherefore, I pray to you who are good and loves mankind, keep me under your protection and in the shadow of your wings, and grant unto me with a pure conscience and even unto my last breath to partake of your holy things unto forgiveness of sins and unto life everlasting. For you are the bread of life, the fountain of holiness, the giver of good things. And to you we ascribe glory together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Please be seated. Good morning. So a quick recap from our last session. Today we're going to be talking about the great entrance and the true Bikim and all the associated parts of the liturgy. But we'll do a quick recap because it's been a little bit of a longer break since our last class. We had to push back the class this month to this week from a couple weeks ago. So last month we finished talking about the first half of the liturgy, which is called, the, does anybody remember, Liturgy of the... Catechumens, good. Liturgy of the Word or Liturgy of the Catechumens. So the, uh, the culmination of this part of the liturgy is the scripture readings. So the epistle readings, the gospel, and the homily or the sermon. We discussed in detail what it means when the priest or deacon says, let us be attentive. Uh, this is a, calls us, of course, to pay attention, obviously. Uh, and then uh, because it is, as, it is as if we are sitting at the feet of Christ. When we hear the gospel and the epistles, it's, we don't say we're just hearing the words of Christ. It's as if Christ is coming and speaking to us himself personally right here in the church. So in the scripture readings are contained all the wisdom of the gospels. In a world which is lacking in wisdom, and in many cases devalues or destroys wisdom altogether, the wisdom contained in these books, the epistle, like I said, the epistle and the gospels and the sermon, which is the interpretation, um, is very crucial to our spiritual well-being. The epistles we talked about first, they come from several places, either the Acts of the Apostles, the writings of St. Paul, or the letters of St. Peter, St. John the Theologian, St. James, or St. Jude. The epistle writings are the same message as the gospel writers, um, but they're not focused on the life of Christ, but rather on teaching the faithful, the lessons that Christ taught in a more uh, detailed way. The Gospels have a higher position in our liturgy than the epistles because they are the accounts of Christ's life and his words directly. So when we hear the Gospel, like I said, we're hearing Christ's words all over again. It's like we're experiencing them for the first time. These words should guide us in our lives when we, leave, when we leave the church too and re-enter the world because hearing the gospel places a big responsibility on us to live by the gospel. It's not enough just to come and to pay attention and to listen. We have to take the gospel in our hearts and take it with us into the world. And this requires humility to receive the gospel and to transform us, to allow God to transform us. I don't know if you guys remember I told the story of the little Greek Yaya who was in the, sto- in, the, in the bookstore who didn't even know how to read, but she would keep a Bible and she would leave it open in front of her icons and she would pray to God to let the message come into her heart even though she couldn't read. And so God would enlighten her because she was humble. So that's the humility that we have to have and not simply to rely on our own intelligence, even though all of us, or most of all of us are educated these days. And last but not least, the sermon, which takes place traditionally following the gospel, uh, is an explanation of the gospel. And here the priest or the bishop that's preaching has an extreme responsibility 
to teach according to the message. If he teaches contrary to that message, he's leading the sheep astray. So please pray for us priests when we preach to be enlightened and to lead the flock of Christ well. Okay, now we move forward. So, we've left the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the catechumens, and we've entered what we call the liturgy of the faithful. Now that the scripture readings and the sermon are finished, the liturgy shifts. We have a shift. Not so much as a change of focus. What do I mean by that? It's not like we stop praying for all the things that we prayed for in the first half of the liturgy and pray for something else. But rather it focuses, hyper-focuses, specifically on the sacrament of Holy Communion. On the sacrifice that will be offered by all the people through the priests to God. And for us to be prepared to receive those gifts and to be transformed. In uh, the liturgy book written by Father John Magulius, which is a wonderful resource for Orthodox Christians, he has an explanation of everything that happens in the service. He writes, think for a moment, and this is in your quote sheet as well, think for a moment, in the first part of the liturgy, we prayed for all things, for the entire world. Now it's time to focus our total being in receiving the Lord our God. So instead of praying for everything, we hyper-focus on the sacrament. So this is the shift of the, from the liturgy of the catechumens to the liturgy of the faithful. And we use this term, liturgy of the faithful, because it will build up to the sacrament of Holy Communion, which is only for those who are initiated and baptized into the mysteries of the church. So only those who are full members of the church can receive Holy Communion. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Are there any questions so far? on the liturgy of the faithful, anything like that. So when does it end, Father, the liturgy of the catechumens with the gospel? It's with the conclusion of the sermon, if the sermon is done at that point, or the gospel. And I'll talk now about like the liturgical, I'll, dis- I'll discuss it in just a minute, so we'll get, have a better idea of when the shift actually takes place. So to illustrate better this shift, as we're saying, Uh, I want to talk about a portion of the liturgy that actually most Greek Orthodox churches don't use anymore. That most of the churches don't, we don't do it. And these are commonly known as the litany, excuse me, the litany, meaning a list of petitions, of the catechumens. And so this group of petitions and prayers, which takes place right after the sermon or the gospel reading, depending on when the sermon is done, because some priests preach at the end, some do it after the gospel, etc., Um, It really shows us that we're shifting from one to the other. Up until this point in the service, for example, all the petitions that are done by the priest or the deacon are calling the the laity, calling the whole congregation to pray together. How many times do we hear me say or Father Timothy or the deacons when we have deacons? Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. We're calling everyone to pray together. But in these petitions the litany of the catechumens, which again are usually not done, but I think it's important to know that they exist, Uh, the prayers, the petitions are directly formed to God. They start out with, let us say with all our soul and all our mind, let us say, Lord Almighty, God of our fathers, we pray to you, hear us and have mercy. You see, we're not saying, let us pray to the Lord. We're praying, we're speaking to God in these petitions. And then, have mercy on us, O God, according to your great mercy. We pray to you, hear us, and have mercy. So that's the first indication that we're shifting into something new. Why this change? Well, the priest or deacon is now preparing to offer Holy Communion, to offer the sacrifice. And since we have to take on such a great responsibility, he's crying out to God for mercy and grace to offer them worthily. Following that first set of petitions are petitions offered for the catechumens. So let's talk a little bit about what a catechumen actually is. In former times, it was a formal group of people. Catechumens were all, everyone that were being instructed in the Christian faith to eventually be baptized. And they were, they were a formal group within the church. In some cases, catechumens would be learning and studying for more than three years. And that shows us that it was a very serious part of the life of the church. At this point in the liturgy, the whole group of catechumens in the community would come forward to be prayed for. And I've only seen this ever done one time. It was at an Antiochian church, and they had two or three catechumens, and they brought them forward at this point, and they read these petitions for them. And so these petitions, I'll give you a sampling. It says, let us the faithful, meaning those who are already baptized, 
Pray for the catechumens, that the Lord will have mercy on them, that the Lord will bring them to holy illumination, meaning baptism, of course, that the Lord will reveal to them the gospel of righteousness, so on and so forth. So all these petitions are for the benefit of the catechumens. After praying for them, however, the catechumens are asked to leave the church. He says, all catechumens depart. Let all catechumens depart, all catechumens depart. Let no catechumens remain, only the faithful. So now, the question is, why would the priest or the deacon, if there's a deacon, ask the catechumens to leave the church? And that is because the catechumens who are not baptized uh, are not able to receive Holy Communion. St. Nicholas Cavasilas, when he, in his explanation of the liturgy, says that the uninitiated have no right to be present at the sacraments, not even to receive it, but to be present. And I'll talk a little bit about why we don't do that anymore in just a second, so don't be confused. Think of it this way. I had this explained to me once, and I thought it was very good, so I'm going to share it with you. When you have guests over to your house, you invite them in, you take off their coats, you offer them a drink and something to snack on before dinner so they're not hungry. Then you feed them a delicious meal. And then, of course, you show them the house. If it's their first time coming over, you show them the house. You take them into your nice finished basement. You sit in the living room. You might even have a drink in your private office. But what's the one place that you don't take them? The bedroom, correct. The bedroom. And why is that? Because the bedroom is the most private and intimate place in the whole house. No one can enter there besides the husband and the wife. And it's the same thing with Holy Communion and the way that we see it in the Orthodox Church. Holy Communion is the most intimate experience that an Orthodox Christian person can have with Christ. It is the most intimate experience, I'm going to say it again, that we can have with our Lord. In this sacrament, we literally become one with God. Just like in marriage, we say the two shall become one flesh. So only those who have entered into that relationship, those who have been baptized and are full members in the church, have permission to enter and receive Holy Communion. In the past, the catechumens were not even allowed to stay for the sacrament. Nowadays, in the past, they wanted to keep it a mystical. They wanted to keep it a secret. They didn't want to share uh, with the catechumens um, in order to kind of... There was a mentality of keeping them in the dark almost so that they didn't uh, understand everything until they entered the church so that the final lesson, so to speak, of being an Orthodox Christian would take place here in the church by receiving Holy Communion. That would be the fulfillment of their education, so to speak. Nowadays, though, in the age of technology, in the age of uh, Facebook where people take pictures in the altar and during church and they live stream as we do, you know, we live stream our services online, uh, you know, even in Greece years ago, for, for years they've been street broadcasting liturgies on TV. The seat, there's not really any mystery of what takes place, so to speak, during the liturgies. So it's not really an issue to allow the catechumens to remain in the church uh, and simply not receive Holy Communion. So these petitions, I'll go back to the petitions, transition then into prayers of preparation for Holy Communion, especially for the priest. And, the, and this is where the transition from the liturgy of the catechumens, you were asking, Maria, you were asking when is the transition? This is kind of when the transition take, would take place, if these petitions are done. When the catechumens are departing and the priest begins to pray for his own preparation to offer the sacrifice. As I said earlier, however, these petitions are usually not done. For example, here at Panagias, we don't, we don't use them. And in many churches, we don't. Father Lawrence Farley, who wrote a book on the liturgy, he explains that this is because for many years there were not any catechumens because wherever orthodoxy had spread, in many places where orthodoxy had spread, the missionary efforts were so successful that there was no one left to missionize. There was no one left to, to baptize. So, for example, in Greece, where the population is 90-whatever percent orthodox, the only people that they were baptizing were newborns. Well, you're not going to make a, a newborn a catechumen, we baptize them. So, if, you know, there's no need to have catechumen prayers if there are no catechumens. But Father Lawrence also says that he makes a case about why we should bring these petitions back. 
he says, the days of the early church, this is on your quote sheet as well. He says, the days of the early church have returned. For as in those days, the church now exists in the midst of an unbelieving and often hostile society. The church increasingly finds itself an island of faith and striving for holiness in the midst of a sea of unbelief and sin. To survive, we need to convert to Christ men and women who have never known him and bring them to the obedience of the faith. And the historical institution by which the church carries out this task is the catechumenate or the, the order of the catechumens. So in other words, he's saying now we have catechumens again. We, have, we live in America. People are converting to orthodoxy all the time. So there's a need now to bring back these prayers and petitions for the catechumens. To give you an example, last year here at Panagias, we had five catechumens. A couple of them are here amongst you right now. And uh, so we had five adult catechumens, and that was just in our one church. Imagine how many there were in Chicago, how many there were in the United States, how many there were in Russian churches, in Antiochian churches. There's a lot. If you add it up, it's going to be a lot. So we should pray for them, too, in the liturgy, which, of course, is our highest form of prayer. And so, he, Father Lawrence, and I would make the case as well that maybe we should start thinking about adding these, this part of the service back in. The only portion of this section that's no longer used that still remains is the final prayer and exclamation. The priest prays, and this should be on your sheet as well. Again, in countless times, we fall before you, and we implore you, O good one who loves mankind, that you, having regarded our prayer, may cleanse our souls and bodies from every defilement of flesh and spirit, and grant to us to stand before your holy altar of sacrifice, free of guilt and condemnation. So when the priest is praying and he says, cleanse our souls and bodies, he's talking about the clergy that are present. And we know that because it says to stand before your holy altar of sacrifice. He continues, grant also, God, to those who pray with us, progress in life, faith, and spiritual understanding. So now he's praying for the whole community. Grant that they always worship you with awe and love, partake of your holy mysteries without guilt or condemnation, and be deemed worthy of your heavenly kingdom. That, and then he exclaims out loud for everyone to hear that always being guided by, guarded by your power, we may send up glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. So we see from this prayer that the focus of the prayer is forgiveness and purification for the clergy to offer the gifts to God and that the people may receive them worthily and not to their own condemnation. So now the focus is totally on the sacrament. Again, in the words of Father Lawrence, how can the priest, a mere man, one indeed bound by the desires of the flesh, as all men are, dare to approach? Only indeed through the mercy of God. And it is this mercy for which these prayers of access ask. So he's asking to be worthy to approach the altar and offer the gifts. And this exclamation, of course, is our cue, so to speak, for the cherubic hymn and for the great entrance. So now we'll talk a little bit about the cherubic hymn. This section of the liturgy, the entrance, has a long and storied history. So if you look on your quote sheet, there's a little diagram on the bottom of the first page. This is Hagia Sophia. So in ancient Constantinople, the gifts were prepared in a separate building called the Skevophilakion. This was the building where the holy vessels and utensils were kept for, that were going to be used for the services. And there was an altar table there where the gifts would be prepared, which now takes place in the altar. So at this point of the service, on your diagram, I've made a little red star. That's kind of the area where the Skevophilakion would be, outside of the main building, in a separate, completely separate building. So at this point in the service, the deacons would leave the deacons, of course, deacon means servant, so they would be sent to gather everything that would be needed for the sacrifice. And then they would get them and bring them back into the church in silence and without any ceremony. This was the, the early ancient church. Meanwhile, the priest and the bishop would be preparing in the altar to offer the sacrifice. But of course, this simplicity does not last for long. As we know, our Orthodox services are not simple by any means. We like to make, give them a lot of... Um, uh, decoration and a lot of uh, elaborateness and, and, uh, and beauty. So at first, the procession was accompanied by the chanting of a psalm, Psalm 24. And this psalm says, Lift up your gates, O princes, and be lifted up, you everlasting gates, and the King of glory shall enter in. 
So it makes sense that this psalm was used because we're talking about opening the doors and welcoming in Christ, welcoming the King of Glory uh, into the church. So it's exactly what's taking place in the, uh, in the procession. So they were using this psalm uh, to illustrate that and to emphasize that. By the 6th century, so we're talking 1,400 years ago, the current cherubic hymn was added to the psalm. So that's, uh, it's also on your sheet. We should know it by now. Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and who sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-creating trinity now lay aside every worldly care so that we may receive the king of all who is invisibly escorted by the angelic hosts. Alleluia. So this is, this is the cherubic hymn. Our church has been using it, think about it, for 1,400 years. So just as the angel's job is to glorify God, our duty also is to glorify God. Just as the angels live without any worldly cares, so we have to put down our own worldly cares in order to approach God. How can we draw near to him when we are so attached to the things behind us, so to speak? How can we climb up to heaven when we are constantly being pulled down by the things on earth? So we have to keep our hearts free of care and worry when we come to church so that we can offer our whole heart to Christ our God. But even this edition of the true became was not enough for the church. We wanted more. We wanted to make it more beautiful. So eventually, the priests also joined in the procession. In the beginning, it was just the deacons. So now the priests are joining in. And as the priests would pass through the church, some of the faithful would pull on the priest's felonion. The felonion is the long cape. I'm not wearing it right now. I put it in the altar. But they would pull, they would tug on the felonion, kind of think of a little kid pulling on his dad's dad or mom's you know pants or something to get their attention and uh, they would ask for the priest to remember them in the sacrifice they would say remember me in the sacrifice it's kind of like the prayer of the thief uh, when christ is on the cross and the priest would respond by saying may the lord god remember you in his kingdom always now and forever into the ages of ages but it was done quietly for every person that said this to the priest he said it quietly back to them which is not how we do it anymore Later, this quiet commemoration was said out loud and for everybody. At first, it was done for the, on the emperor's behalf, because uh, the emperor was always in church, and then for eventually it became a common uh, exclamation, may the Lord God remember all of you in his kingdom, now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. And over time, Psalm 24 kind of fell by the wayside, and all we have left is the true Bikim with this exclamation, may the Lord God remember all of you in his kingdom. Before the entrance takes place, the priest also senses the altar. So the sensing was added. He senses the altar, the iconostasis, and the people while saying the 50th Psalm, which again is a, is a prayer of repentance and renewal. So we have these themes of repentance, getting ready to receive worthily the gifts of, of Christ's body and blood. St. Germanos, who also wrote an explanation of the divine liturgy, he explains that the censer represents the Holy Spirit, he says the coal and the fire is like the Spirit, which if we're familiar with the Old Testament or even with the New Testament and Pentecost, uh, comes down in the form of fire many times. And he says the smoke that the, the fire creates is the presence of Christ coming invisibly among us and surrounding us with his blessings through his sacrifice. So now before we get to the great entrance proper, I want to ask if there's any questions before we move on. No? Okay, we'll continue. So the great entrance. The question is, and I've, had to, I've asked you guys this question for other parts of the liturgy as well, why do we still do this procession if the practical reason that it was originally done is no longer applicable? You know, nowadays in our church, we don't have a skivophilacion. We don't have a separate building where the gifts are presented or the, where the gifts are prepared. We don't have to leave the church to bring them back in the church. Really, if you think about it, the priest picks up the gifts, he walks around, he comes back in the altar and puts them on the altar table, maybe five or ten feet away from where they originally started. So we have to ask ourselves, why? Why do we do it? So again, if we look at Father Lawrence, and this quote's in your, pack, in your packet as well, he says, in this procession, we proclaim that Jesus Christ, the saving sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of Lords is coming into our midst in Holy Communion. So he's saying we are welcoming Christ himself among us in Holy Communion. The adornments celebrate this fact. In other words, the procession and everything we do with it 
celebrate this fact and call us to lay aside all our earthly cares as we approach the Eucharistic chalice, meaning Holy Communion, to receive the King of all. He comes upborne and escorted by the angelic hosts and welcomes us to his heavenly banquet table. As the church begins to offer the Eucharistic sacrifice, the church holds high festival as it brings in the gifts of bread and wine. So imagine if some uh, celebrity or a very famous person was coming to your house, you would do everything you could to make their entrance, to make their welcome something special, something uh, over the top. So that's why, you know, in, in the same vein, we do the great entrance because we are welcoming not only a famous person, not only a celebrity, but Christ, our King and our God, into our midst. So let's look a little bit deeper into the symbolism of the great entrance. So St. Germanos, I'll turn to him again. He explains that the great entrance is like Christ's procession to Golgotha for the crucifixion. So he, he's comparing the procession as Christ carrying his cross to be crucified. Father Magulius explains that this is why the Ayir, and I have one here, the Ayir is the cover that the priest wears on his back during the great entrance. As you can see in the middle, what is the symbol that we see? The symbol here in the middle is a cross. This is not a, it's a little more of a rounded cross, but it's a cross. So the priest wears the cross on his back. So if we're comparing Golgotha, walking to Golgotha, to the great entrance, it makes sense then that the priest is carrying the, the cross on his back the way that Christ had to carry his own cross to the crucifixion. So Father Magulius explains that that's why you see many times on the Ayir uh, a cross and why the priest wears it on his back. He's imitating Christ who carried his cross to Golgotha to be crucified. St. Germanos also offers a different explanation. He says that this entrance, this procession, is like the burial procession. So now imagine Christ has already been crucified and, and has died, and we're carrying him to his tomb. He says that the prothesis, the table of preparation then, is Golgotha. That's where the sacrifice is offered. Then we have, uh, he says that the viscos, which is the tray that the gifts are placed on, are like the hands of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who of course are the ones that bury Christ. He says the cover of the viscos, the small coverings, are like the napkin that is placed over Christ's face in his tomb. And the ayir, which I just showed you, is like the stone that seals the tomb and does not allow, and is guarded by the Roman soldiers. So we have this imagery then of the burial of Christ taking place during the divine liturgy. So Saint Germanos, I'll quote him here, this is in your packet. He says, Christ, thus Christ is crucified, life is buried, the tomb is secured, the stone is sealed. In the company of the angelic powers, the priest approaches, standing no longer as on earth, but attending at the heavenly altar, before the altar of the throne of God. And he contemplates the great, ineffable, and unsearchable mystery of God. He gives thanks, proclaims the resurrection, and confirms the faith in the Holy Trinity. So St. Germanos offers this beautiful imagery of what is taking place then during the great entrance. Along these same lines, the priest exclaims during the great entrance, the prayer of the thief, as I said earlier, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Remember, this is the prayer of the thief at the cross. So in the entrance, the priest says, May the Lord God remember all of you in his kingdom, always now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. St. Nicholas Cavasilas, he emphasizes that this exclamation, this part of the liturgy is extremely important. This is another one of your quotes. He says, During this ceremony, we must prostrate ourselves before the priest and entreat him to remember us in the prayer which he is about to say. For there is no other means of supplication so powerful, so certain of acceptance, as that which takes place through the, this most holy sacrifice, which has freely cleansed us of our sins and iniquities. In other words, the divine liturgy is the most powerful weapon that we have as Orthodox Christians. So it's important that we pray, we as the community, pray together that the priest will offer the prayers on our behalf and that God will remember us in his holy kingdom in Father Magulius's book, another one of your quotes, he says, It is imperative that we realize the importance of this liturgical moment and ask God to remember us. For if he does not, it is, is, it is, 
It is as if we had never been born. So if God does not remember us, it's like we never existed. If we want to live in his kingdom, and we acknowledge the great sacrifice he makes for our salvation. So at this point in the service, our thought should be, remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. At this point, the priest places the gifts after the entrance is concluded. He places the gifts on the altar and covers them with the ayir, which I just showed you. And uh, while he's doing this, he senses and he finishes the 50th psalm, which he had been saying during this great sensing. So our last point of discussion, I think we have a few minutes left, is uh, the prayer uh, the priest says before the great entrance takes place. It's a long prayer, so I won't read through the whole thing, but I have it on your reference sheet. So please, if you have some, a few minutes today, take a minute to read through it. I highly recommend it. It's a very beautiful prayer. So I'll only comment uh, on a few opening lines. So if you want to follow along on your packets, the opening lines say, No one bound by carnal desires and pleasures is worthy to approach, draw near, or minister to you, the King of glory. So basically, nobody that has earthly attachments is worthy to approach and serve the King of glory. For to serve you is great and awesome, even for the heavenly powers. So even the angels that come and serve God understand what an awesome task this is. This is a reflection, of course, of the high ministry of the priesthood. That the priest does things that even the angels cannot, which is to offer the sacrifice. And this is the reason why St. Cosmas at Olos, who was a saint um, during Revolutionary Age Greece, he says, if I ever encounter the emperor of Byzantium or the king and a poor priest, so he's saying if I'm on the road and I see the emperor or I see a poor priest on the street, I will first run to kiss the priest's hand and then I will greet the emperor. And if I ever encounter an angel or an archangel, or a cherubim walking on the same road with a priest, I will first run to kiss the hand of the priest, and then the hand of the angel. So we can understand from that, that the liturgy is a huge responsibility for the priest, and for all of us. But especially the priest, since he's the one that's offering the sacrifice. He's taking the place of Christ in the sacrifice who no matter how holy the priest is, he is not worthy or capable of fulfilling such a duty. Only through the grace of God is he able to do so. Only through Christ's desire to fill the priest's gaps, so to speak, and heal his shortcomings, can the priest serve the liturgy worthily. I want to share a quick story with you from this book, this wonderful book. It's called Experiences During the Divine Liturgy by Father Stephanos and Agnostopoulos. It's a wonderful book. I want to read a quick story here to finish off our our lesson today. Uh, This is page 241. So it says, Before the year 1940, in the cell of the three hierarchs, which is on Mount Athos, there lived a very holy father named Father Joachim, and he was a Romanian priest, monk. Before this father died, he saw a vision. And he he saw this vision that he had completed the divine liturgy and was consuming the chalice afterwards. And he had consumed it and cleaned it, and he suddenly saw many angels on his right and on his left, and they were shining and brilliant. The entire holy altar and the small church temple was filled with an inconceivable, amiable light and divine sweetness and beauty. So this priest now is seeing angels and light fill the altar. And he says, then the angels in one voice told him, so all the angels are speaking together, we have come to take you. Tell us what are your deeds. In other words, Your time has come. You're an old monk. God has called your soul to be with him in paradise. What are your deeds? If they are good and acceptable to God, we will take you to him, to his perpetual joy and blessing. Otherwise, we will take you to comfortless hell. And that blessed father, it says, was stunned. And as he was stuttering, he said in extreme humility, I did not do anything. I do not remember doing anything good. And the angels respond, well then, What shall we do with you? Where shall we take you? Fifty years on Mount Athos, and you have not done anything? And he said, Well, since I became a priest, I serve the divine liturgy every day. I would commemorate as many monks and fathers of Mount Athos as I could. For many years I would commemorate the names of people I was given in the world, and I prayed for all the Orthodox Christians and for the whole world. 
I would beseech God's tenderheartedness for all those and had my hopes only in God's mercy, both for me and for the others. I shed many tears on a daily basis for the Lord Jesus Christ and his all immaculate mother's mercy. I hoped and only hope in the holy God's mercy and forbearance. I do not remember doing anything else. So the only good thing in his eyes that he had ever done was to pray for God's mercy in the divine liturgy, knowing that he was unworthy. So the angels replied, Not because of your deeds, but because you had your hopes only in God's mercy. Very well then, come with us. But the priest stopped them. So they're getting ready to take him to heaven. And he says, Well, can it wait until tomorrow? Can it wait until tomorrow so I can tell my spiritual father and all the brothers? Give me some time to prepare. And the angel's response was, Very well then, we will be obedient and come tomorrow. And so it happened that the next day, the angels came again and took him from this earth of life. And so we see the mentality that the clergy must have when they serve the liturgy. And all of us, really, when we come to church, the mentality that we have to have, that really on this earth, we haven't done anything good, that we haven't done anything worthy of God's blessings and God's mercy and God's love. Because it's only in that spirit of humility that we turn to God's mercy. If we say, well, I did X, Y, and Z, and that was good, we might trick ourselves into thinking that we earned eternal life, that we earned paradise. But if we always have the mentality that, Lord, I've done nothing good, have mercy on me, that's when he will have mercy on you, and he will accept you into his heavenly kingdom, and that you will receive the gifts of his body and blood worthily. So that's why it's important for the people and the priests not on, uh, to pray not only for themselves, but for the whole community as well. As priests, we do nothing good except pray for you and for the whole world in the liturgy. And we in turn need your prayers for God's mercy and forgiveness for taking on such a great responsibility, even though we know we cannot possibly do it worthily. So with that, are there any questions? That was a lot. We covered a lot of ground today. Any questions about the Cherubim, the Great Entrance, the Catechumens, anything like that? Yes, a couple of questions. I you know, remember another denomination approached me during the Holy Week last year. Yes. And the only question they asked when I found the left church was, what is the significance of the bells on the censer? The bells on the censer? And when I told them that from a young child, I was told that it helps to war off the devil in the presence of the church, I wanted to ask you if I could describe it accurately. Sure, so the question, just so we all hear it, is, that, is what is the symbolism of the bells on the censer? I talked about the charcoal and the fire and the smoke. But the bells, typically, what I, what I was taught was that the bells, usually there's 12 bells on the censer. 12, whenever we hear 12, our minds should be brought to the 12 apostles. So just as the apostles brought the message of the gospel and spread the joyful news into the whole world, the joyful bells of the censer, whenever the priest senses, is like the apostles preaching and bringing the good news to the people, which is like, that's, that was the interpretation that I had, had learned. Not to say that the one you had learned is incorrect, but that's the, that's the one that I had learned. Are there any other questions? Yes. What's the difference between sending the catechumens out uh, before the great entrance and then uh, proclaiming the doors and doors before the great Sure. Uh, well, well, we'll talk about the doors and doors more in depth in a future talk. But So the question was, what's the difference between s telling the catechumens to depart now and then the, the exclamation, the doors, the doors, uh, in wisdom, let us be attentive before the creed? So... The, there's a theological, the one has a theological explanation, the other has a practical explanation. So the, the, the departure of the catechumens, as we discussed, is uh, more for, a, for their, it's part of their being a catechumen. Um, as they're not initiated, as they're not baptized, in the early church they would be asked to depart because really they had no, they had no reason to be at the second part of the liturgy because they can't take communion. You know, it's like, Basically, you're just going to make them stand there for another hour, two hours, or whatever. In the old church, the liturgies were even longer. So they would let them, they would go. They would be asked to depart because they were not part of the body of the church that would be able to receive the holy gifts. The doors, the doors was an exclamation from the deacon to the doorkeeper. So in the old church, uh, when the church was under persecution especially, there was always doorkeepers. It was an official ministry of the church, the doorkeeper. And his job was to, whenever somebody would walk in, 
to kind of size them up and make sure they were there for the right reasons. Because many times, especially in the early church, uh, the Roman soldiers would, in, would invade during the Christian uh, liturgies and they would arrest and eventually martyr all the Christians that were in the church. So the doorkeeper's job was to uh, protect the body of the faithful. So at that point of the service, they would lock the doors in the old church to protect the community from danger and harm from outside, from the outside. So that's kind of the two different explanations. I hope that makes sense. Father, uh, when a deacon participates in the divine liturgy, yes. and right after the uh, main ent uh, entrance, uh, he changes his belt. That's, during, that's actually during the Lord's Prayer he does that. Why is that done? Uh, so the question was, when a deacon serves, he changes, at, at, during the Lord's Prayer, he changes the, his belt, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but he changes his belt formation from one way to another way. There's an X on the back, kind of like the way the altar boys have. It's very similar. Um, why did they do that? Um, that's a good question. I'll, honestly, I'll have to do some more research to find out. Uh, I know it's, it's to receive communion. That's, the, that, that's the, the formation they use to receive Holy Communion. Um, but I'm not sure what the symbolism is. I'll have to do some research for you. So the next, next class, I'll, I'll bring that back for you. Um, we're over time, but if there's one more question, I can answer. Sure, really when you yeah. said about the, the bells, yes. why do some uh, parishes take the bells off before? Um, during Holy Week? During Holy Week. Well, it, during Holy Week, in some parishes, there's also a censer that's used that only has one bell. Typically, there's one bell left on it. Well, if we use the analogy that we used earlier of the apostles, during the time of Holy Week, what event takes place? What's the main event? the betrayal and crucifixion of Christ. So we go from 12 apostles to how many apostles? How many stayed with Christ through the crucifixion? One, one right? St. John the Theologian. So in that case, we leave one bell to represent the one apostle that stayed during that time. And then on Pascha, we use the full set again because we're, everybody's restored at that point. And then grease pots and pans. And pots and pans and fireworks and whatever you can find. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. God, thank you all for being here. God bless you all. And uh, we'll be meeting again next month for the next session. Thank you. <laughs> Αφούς και νεκρώσεις φούν και κράτησεν Πως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωή μετέστησεν Ο μητρανικής σας αϊπάρθενος